This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 55. Recorded on April 18th, 2013. Hello, everyone. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, hello. How are you doing? I feel like I haven't spoken with you in a while. Is that true? It's true. How is that possible? A couple of weeks. You've been well? I've been well. Yeah, I... Yes, yes. And basically. the weather is wonderful out there? Well, yeah, we had we had some gloomy days for a change, but they're gone. Here at, Today here, it is very gloomy. It is totally cloudy and only 14 degrees Celsius. Ooh, but, you know, it is warmer than it was two weeks ago. That ooh you heard in the background was none other than Michael Schmidt from the Medical University of South Carolina. Hey, Michael. Hello to both of you. You have gloomy weather down there? No, nah, it's a great day to be in South Carolina. It's Chamber of Commerce weather. The sun is out. It's a beautiful 78 degrees, not too much humidity. Good for you. And nice. you are you are in Charleston today. I am in Charleston. For a change. Today. For a <laughs> change. For a for a change, <laughs> fortunately. It's uh it's it's really uh this this is why you live in South Carolina for days like today. But you're inside, of course. I'm inside, yeah. If I was outside you'd be hearing wind noise. And if you by the time you get outside the, the day will be over. So. I get, this is true. <laughs> it's that's but at least you know it's nice out. <laughs> that's true. Today is the day many of us have been waiting for. Michael Schmidt's copper papers have been published, and today we're going to talk about them, and many people have, have asked about these. It seems like it's been a long time, Michael. It's been a, an ordeal uh, moving them through the, the publication process, but it's a testament to the rigor that the peer review process places <laughs> on the science that appears in journals. And um, Well, that is you know, very diplomatic of you to put it that way. No, but I think it's it's very very important. Um, all the papers that end up in scientific journals are fortunately very rigorously reviewed, and that adds to the the quality of the work. And they critique how you design a study. And um, I like to point out to folks that science is the art of the possible. And anytime you um, bring patients into the mix, and this is a study that I'm going to share with you in which there were patients involved in this study. It's really dependent upon variables for which you cannot always design the perfect experiment, and so you really have to go to the great lengths to control for things as best you can. Well, you're a master of the possible, is my conclusion. We, we tried. Mike, we, are, you we tried. Saying, are you saying that people are not mice? People are not mice. Uh. People are not mice. And I think what we're witnessing, to, to go to a little current event topic, is we're seeing that happen with this new virus that's emerging in China, the the new flu virus that I'm sure you have probably are going to tackle shortly on an upcoming TWIV. We have already. Yes. And it was one I of the most downloaded episodes in recent history. Mm. I didn't know. I didn't know whether or not it had posted and yet. We're going to do it again tomorrow. I'm going to keep doing it until this thing is over because people want to hear it. So we'll give them what they want to hear. Yeah. H seven N nine. Very. And what does that have to do with copper, Michael? Uh, copper actually can inactivate the flu virus. So wow. this is actually, if you think about the fact that uh, influenza is a fomite-driven uh, disease process, and you know, the story I'm going to share with you today um, is literally pretty old. Man has been using copper as an antimicrobial since the Bronze Age, uh, literally. In ancient India, about 2800 uh, BCE, we began to use copper to disinfect water drawn from wells 
or rivers. And this was principally the work of, of women who would go down to the well or the river and draw the water in the morning. And they would bring it home and allow it to sit. And they empirically appreciated that when they did this behavior, their infant children would not get diarrhea and die. Huh. And you don't have to be a clinical microbiologist to be able to diagnose diarrhea. Every human knows it when we see it. <laughs> and uh, humans empirically appreciated that when infants got diarrhea, they often didn't survive because of the you know issues associated with dehydration. And of course, diarrhea is um, still a leading cause of death on this planet, even in modern era. And in fact, there was a nature paper back in 2005 that was advocating that the developed world move away from using plastic pitchers to going back to copper pitchers to draw their water. And of course, then we have the, the famous application that former ASM president and head of the National Science Foundation, Rita Colwell, did where she encouraged women to filter their water through sari cloth to remove um, vibrios, and uh, it would actually control cholera. But what Rita never volunteered to tell folks is they were filtering it through sari cloth into copper pots. And so you were filtering the, uh. the copepods, and any of the vibrio that could have probably gotten through were going into the copper vessel to inactivate them. So, yeah, sari's not going to take out vibrio, is it? Well, they're in copepods, so the copepods copepods, got it. are bigger, yeah. and so you would catch the majority of them. But it's the copper pot that um, was working in concert with the sari cloth. So this is an old observation that humans made empirically, and then as we developed stainless steel in the, the 1930s, and we didn't like polishing brass, copper fell out of favor, and in fact, in the New World... Um, many of the public houses used to have copper bars that they would serve your food on. Hmm. And, uh, you know, it was one of the early ways, I guess, to limit food poisoning because when you ate in a public house, if you didn't get sick, you would go back. But if you got sick, you would never go back. <laughs> you know, so. Another empirical observation. Huh? Well, humans are really good Jenner. At, em Every at, at empiric observations. Yeah, and you're right, Jenner. Jenner. Milkmaids didn't get smallpox. I'm still amazed when people make these observations. Yeah, and it's 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 really remarkable. So my story starts off with uh, Florence Nightingale, and <laughs> you was know she, was she one of your co-authors. <laughs> well, you know, I had to go back. <laughs> I had to go back and find her original reference, which is in a Nature from 1850 something or other. Mm -hmm. Because someone wanted the original citation. So I had to go back into the stacks. And the medical university has been around since 1832. And by God, we had the journal. <laughs> and so I literally went to the stacks and got this nature journal and got her original observation. And Nightingale made the observation. And her ideas about environmental hygiene literally transformed medicine and the care of sick in hospitals earning her the title that many of us have forgotten as Savior of Soldiers because she worked during the Crimean War mm. and she appreciated what we now all take for granted. When the environment of a hospital was kept clean, death rates from infectious diseases dropped from the then rate of 40%. Four out of 10 of the hospitalized patients were dying to 2%, where only two out of 100 would die. Wow. So that was Nightingale's great contribution to infection control, if you will, simply scrub the hospital clean. And so for more than a century now, healthcare has been challenged to keep environmental surfaces clean of microbes. And you only need to go into the infection control -ish literature to begin to look at these things. But I didn't know any of these fun facts when I, when I started that – in the United States, we spend $10 billion cleaning and disinfecting our hospitals each year. And Phil Carling and Susan Wang have established that about 50% of the objects that need to be cleaned and disinfected routinely in our hospitals each day are not. Hmm. We're only cleaning half of the stuff. 
So wow. you you posit the question: Do we need to? Spend why 20? is that? Why is that? Can you do you have a feeling, sort of a general feeling, why that is? Is it money? Is it poor training? What? How do you how do you it's, explain that? It's the uh, high incidence of uh, occupancy because we have designed hospitals to be very similar to hotels, meaning you need a, a high occupancy rate to make them a viable business. And the second, and this is probably the most important reason, is you can't tell things are dirty from a microbial perspective. Huh. And we don't routinely survey the environment to ask what is the microbial load, which is um, the subject of, of the paper that I published along with my colleagues in July of 2012 in the journal Clinical Microbiology that asked the, the simple question, does the burden, the bacteria burden in the environment represent a, a clear and present danger to patients? And so when you begin to you talk yes. about the paper in the journal of clinical microbiology, right? Correct. The journal sustained reduction of microbial burden on common hospital surfaces through introduction of copper. That's the one, right? That is that is the one. So, uh, let me give you some other facts to keep in the back of your mind as as this story evolves, because this what this is what really drove it home and and piqued my interest in this whole situation. So, if I asked you the question, if one full jumbo jet crashed each day, killing everyone on board. And the average jumbo jet holds between 250 and 290 patients or people. This is precisely the number of people that die each day in a U.S. hospital from a hospital-associated infection. One aircraft crashes each day. Now, if it were an aircraft, we'd be taking care of it, right? Yeah. I mean <laughs> – Boeing and Airbus and Embra and all the other mm. airplane manufacturers would immediately address why their plane is falling out of the sky. Yet this is precisely the number of folks that are dying. And it has to do with our the, the basic risk premise. In the U.S., there are about 35 million people uh, admitted and discharged from a U.S. hospital each year. And the infection rate is about 5%. So the chances of developing a hospital-associated infection are about 1 in 20, or 5%. And if you do develop that infection, you have another 5% chance of dying from that infection. So your overall risk of death being admitted to a U.S. hospital is 1 in 400. And the really scary statistic, or that if you think about it in terms of of capital costs, it literally is fueling the debate about healthcare because it's the fourth leading cause of death or the sixth leading cause of death, depending on how you parse the statistics, behind heart disease, cancer, and stroke. Whether it's fourth or sixth is really, you know, debating how many angels can you hit on fit on ahead of a pin. But this really accounts for forty five billion in added healthcare costs to the United States healthcare bill. And everyone pays it, $45 billion. Now, the CDC, and probably using last century's data from the, the 90s, published uh, an estimate that uh, perceives that an HAI adds about 208% to your hospital bill, or about $43,000 per patient. But re really set it in stone for me is the, the average length of stay in a U.S. hospital is about five days, but if you get a hospital-associated infection, you add 19 additional days on average to your length of stay. So you go from 5 to 24 or 23, depending on how, how you round the numbers. And so this is pretty substantial in terms of uh, what's actually you know, driving uh, the system. And, you know, ASM – has been for many years doing, as part of its communications outreach, doing a, a hand hygiene campaign. And, um, you know, one of the things I learned from the, our hand hygiene campaign is that, you know, more folks will die from HAIs, which, you know, hand hygiene does help that, 
then uh, folks die from automobile accidents. 30,000, 33,000 folks die per year from automobile accidents, while 100,000 folks will die from an HAI. So HAI it, being? Hospital-associated infections. You're in the hospital and you acquire an infection. And there's a really um, fancy definition that the National Health Safety Network has, and it's called the CDC NHSN Surveillance Definition of Healthcare-Associated Infections. And I won't bore you with the long definition, but for the purposes of our discussion today, this organization, the CDC slash NHSN, defines a hospital-associated infection as a localized or systemic condition resulting from an adverse reaction to the presence of an infectious agent or its toxins. And this is what really drives home the significance of one of the papers we're going to talk about, is that there cannot be, for you to be able to call an HAI, there must be no evidence, underscore the word no evidence, that the infection was present or incubating at the time of admission to the acute care setting. Mm. Well, so that, it's, that makes it, sense. it's, it's, um, and a lot of things, you know, part of the, the struggle with our, our trial is that you need humans to call these infections because, you know, an infection can sneak up on you. You know, do you spike a fever? Um, you know, is your x ray, is your blood, is your catheter becoming uh, cloudy? Is your urine have more than 100,000 colony forming units? per uh, mill, all of these things factor into the system. So in that first JCM paper, we began to look at answering the question of challenges of controlling HAIs from the environment. And early on, um, and a lot of this has to do with a statement made by uh, Bob Weinstein, who is a noted infectious disease specialist. And Bob made the statement about infections in the ICU, and he argued that the majority of them were literally coming from, from the patient. You know, it's, it's barriers are breaking down, and, and that's uh, part of the reason that the HAI rate is, is so high. He said that the patient's endogenous flora, 40 to 60 percent, was effectively, you know, it's their own inoculum that's making them sick as barriers break down. And it has to do with the severity of the illness. And then he assigned 20 to 40 percent to uh, cross-infection via the hands that the healthcare workers are moving the microbes within the environment, which is the impetus for hand hygiene campaigns. And then there's the other variables are antibiotic uh, resistance uh, moving amongst the microbes in the hospital. And then finally, he threw the environment in and he says, well, the environment's probably another 20 percent and it totals out to 100. So we began to use that number thinking that the environment would contribute about 20 percent to the infection. So we thought that… Uh, hold on before you go on. Uh, don't you think that these are sort of fairly soft? Figures? Oh yes, I mean, it's barbarically difficult. To oh figure yeah, this out. I mean, it's not it's not an easy task. You can't just will it. Oh no, really... and and you know, folks have been wrestling with this problem for a long time, and trying to do careful and and controlled experiments uh, is is really the struggle and. So that's why we broke our study into these three different manuscripts. The first question that we ask is, are the microbes in the environment and are they at a level that represents a danger to the patient? So we go to the food industry and the food industry has standards. And for example, in New York City, Vincent's hometown, the health department requires that a meat slicer that's used to slice the beautiful pastrami and corned beef that you can get for lunch there cannot have more than five colony form units per centimeter squared mm. in order to be recognized as safe to slice meat in a New York deli. That's based on some experience, I presume. 
it's based on experience and you know again humans being an empiric species we we take observations and the food industry you know for better or worse we understand what makes us sick because food poisoning is a big deal yep. and uh, so new york city's health department and you know it then promulgated throughout the the food industry they they began to advance this number and one of the leaders or two of the leaders in the field stephanie dancer and Chris Griffith from the United Kingdom, who are the gurus of uh, the public health service of the United Kingdom, trying to wrench HAIs out of their system, came up with the number and they, they said, you know, five sounds good, but let's go for a little bit lower. And they said two and a half colony forming units per centimeter squared is a reasonable number. Below that number, it's the level is considered benign. And above that number represents a danger. And these are just aerobic colony counts on traditional sheep's blood auger, TSA sheep's blood auger, which will grow a large number of aerobes that are in the environment. So we're not even looking for the anaerobes or the fastidious. We're just looking for things that will grow. But then Chris and, and Dr. Dancer said, well, for frank pathogens like MRSA, methicillin-resistant staph aureus and vancomycin-resistant enterococci and C. diff and um, the new CREs, if their concentration is above one, that represents a hazard to the patient. And if you think about it, one colony forming unit per centimeter squared, if you're thinking about touching something, that's really a pretty low number. Mm. But I guess it's about proximity to the patient that really drives that that risk characteristic uh, home. So we used we used Dr. Dancer's number of two and a half as our our standard of uh, assessing risk. And in this first paper, we we asked the question, well, what does the burden look like? And we made this very patient centric. And I should preface by saying that all of the work was done under the guidance of um, Three different IRBs. Uh, at IRB my, being what? Institutional Review Board, so that what we were doing was deemed ethical and appropriate for interacting in a patient care setting. Did you have to get patient approval to do that? No, we did not have to get informed consent because this was part of routine environmental hygiene. Got it. We were surveying and we weren't actually directly interacting with the patient. Right. The other... Uh, institutional review board that we had was um, that of the Office of Risk Protection of the United States Military because all of these studies were funded by uh, the Department of Defense under a contract through the telemedicine uh, command um, out of Fort Detrick or by an agency referred to in the acronym as, as TATRIC. So this study had four different sets of IRBs looking at it, as well as it was subject to peer review before we did anything. And the way the peer review process of our initial proposal came back is we were asked to do it in three phases. One, ask the question, does the environment represent a risk? Because you had uh, Bob Weinstein's statement out, it's only about 20%. So they wanted to know if it was really 20% or more or less. Then we would proceed to answer the question, could the limited placement of a continuously active antimicrobial material, and we selected copper uh, because of the bulk of literature that was out there that said copper could kill bacteria on contact, we, se we selected that. They wanted to then know, would that lower the burden? And this was all before we were allowed to ask questions about patients and infections, which was the third phase. And the third question that we then asked is, if burden is down, does that then translate into fewer infections? Because I was sort of surprised that no one had connected environmental burden to infections. But as Elio points, pointed out earlier, that's really hard to do because you have to have patience and you have to have causality. And so the story I'm going to take you through is first – the average burden on a patient's bed rail, and 
in hospitals, it's all about safety. And just like when we have our small children in their first big boy or big girl bed and we're worried about them falling out, we wall them in with pillows. Well, in a hospital, we have rails. And everyone in a hospital is taught, never turn your back on the patient if the rail is down because they may fall out. And so we always raise the rail. So we did um, a study to ask the question, first, where are the bacteria in the room? And we sampled a large number of different objects to try to figure out where to put the copper and, you know, what places to monitor to get at this risk equation. So we came up with, with six areas. We came up with the rails of the patient's bed because they were frequently handled by the patient, the healthcare worker. And the other thing that we hadn't stumbled into is the visitor. Because oftentimes when visitors come and see patients, they drop the rail to kiss the patient hello, shake their hand, stroke their arm, just, you know, try to fluff their pillow. The rail comes down. Mm. And we hadn't, we hadn't actually perceived that until we actually went over there and actually looked. And what we learned is that the bed rail was really pretty heavily burdened. And rather than measuring a centimeter squared on the rail, we measured a hundred square centimeters. So all my data in the first paper, the JCM paper, is reported as a concentration per hundred centimeters squared because I thought that would give us a better idea of the risk profile that the healthcare worker of picking up a microbe or the patient or the visitor would actually be. And the average rail had about 17,000. And we measured this over a period of 23 months sampling uh, six beds each week, along with um, the overbed tray table, the arms of the visitor's chair, a mice or the uh, nurse's call button. And the nurse's call button lives in the the bed with the patient, and it turns on and off the TV, changes the volume. Some places it's the the telephone uh, earpiece and mouthpiece at the same time. It's like a speakerphone. Uh, the bezel of the uh, monitor that uh, is hooked up to the cardiac sensors on the on the patient. Because I had to look up bezel, by the way. Bezel is the plastic piece that goes around the gadgets, right? Right. Yep. Like a television. And what they do is they, and this is, again, what we observed, is they would rest their hand on that plastic piece when they would tap off the alarms or change screens Mm -hmm. because it's hanging on an arm, and so they would touch it. And, you know, what we learned is that that monitor bezel was pretty dirty if you look at it from uh, a risk perspective. And what we measured were total bacteria in the environment – Total staphylococci, because most of the microbes on our skin are staph, whether they be coagulase negative staph or coagulase positive staph. The coagulase positive are considered to be more pathogenic than the coag negs. We then asked the question specifically how many MRSA were in the room. We also looked for gram negatives, but we were going after dry surfaces because in the ICU, there's not a There's not a frequent encounter with the toilet area because most of the patients have catheters and stool extraction systems. So we didn't think them to be moving out of the bed and and going into the bathroom uh, to relieve themselves. And so we eliminated that from our mix. And we also biased our study by using the ICU since the patient is not ambulatory because what we're trying to understand is the ultimate question is would reducing burden reduce infections? And if the patient is wandering, because the first, the other thing that hospitals do is to try to get the patient out of bed as quickly as possible so they don't become an invalid. And so by staying in the ICU, we controlled our environment in order to get as close to a binary experiment as, as possible. And Michael, where were these studies done? Tell us. Oh, the studies were done at three hospitals, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. And again, this was selected uh, because the, the patient population is unique. Uh, the majority of patients at Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, obviously uh, by its name, are being treated for cancer. And we were in their intensive care unit. So those patients are especially ill. 
Uh, often when you have cancer, you're neutropenic, so you're not going to be able to fight an infection as well as uh, a patient who, who does not have cancer. We then looked at uh, the intensive care unit of the Medical University of South Carolina, my institution's um, medical intensive care unit. And the reason we went to the medical intensive care rather than surgical intensive care is because you need a sufficient length of time to be able to call the infection to the unit. Remember that incubating clause in defining when the, where you got the HAI. And finally, the Ralph H. Johnson Veterans Medical Center, where my good friend Joe John is on staff. And Joe was actually uh, a part of the study. He was one of the co-investigators. He was the lead investigator at the VA. And Dr. Ken Sepkowitz, a leading infectious disease specialist out of Memorial Sloan Kettering, was the lead investigator at what that is, What is that last hospital? What is that located? Uh, the, the VA is located in Charleston. Oh. It's just down the street from us in Charleston. It sit, shares some of the same residents we use within my hospital, but for the most part, the attending physicians are distinct. They're VA physicians, and then there's MUSC physicians. Uh -huh. And then at my hospital, I had our hospital epidemiologist um, and the chief of infectious disease working with me, and that was um, Dr. Cassie Salgado and uh, Dr. Bob Canty. And so we, we had a a good cohort of infectious disease specialists, along with Lisa Steed, who is our, our laboratorian, the director of our, our micro lab. And together, we designed the study to get at the question as, as cleanly as possible. Mm. And, you know, the challenges of controlling hospital-associated infections can be summed up. First, we have the ubiquity of microbes in the environment. We have resilience of bacteria on surfaces because in the text of my article, I describe how MRSA can persist for almost up to a year on a surface. Vincent's probably been talking about how long influenza can stay out there in the environment. <laughs> and it's, it, these things are, are, are pretty hardy. The persistence of contamination, this is principally the family of papers that Phil Carling and his colleagues have published that state approximately 50% of the items are cleaned properly at the time they're supposed to be cleaned. And then a subset of that is there's no rec universally recognized standard for environmental cleanliness, which Alio sort of, you know, immediately got is, you know, what should that number be? And I've been a strong advocate and a fan of, of Stephanie Dancers, and I've been advocating that her, her five slash two and a half really needs to be a gold standard because you can measure environmental burden using TSA and TSA isn't a very expense is it's a pretty inexpensive petri plate at being about 22 cents a unit so you can you know look at your hospital um, fairly well and finally we don't have data in the literature that actually describes to a point the contribution of surface contamination to the rate or number of HAIs. That's not been well defined. We, we have a lot of infectious disease specialists speculating, but what Alio and I would term hard science, it's, it's not in the extant literature. And so we thought when we began to do this study, first let's find out how many are there and then answer the question whether or not we could eliminate uh, or drop the in infection rate. And so in the JCM paper, we showed and um, I, I developed a, a really neat way of condensing a lot of data into uh, a stoplight metaphor. Green means go, which I equivocate mm -hmm. to safe. Yellow means caution, mm -hmm. you know, pay special attention here. And red means danger. You, you know, the, the levels are too high. And I have the copper objects and I have the non-copper objects. And so when you look at, look at the figure, most of the, and this is every sample that we took. 
So there's... By the way, let me interrupt for a second. I really want to salute you for your cleverness of how to present the data because this isn't easy. You did a very good job. These papers are very readable and they're, they're easy on the eye. Yeah, it, it, um, I spent a, one of the things working for the Department of Defense is they require you to write monthly reports. So I, I, I wrote a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't publish many papers on this, but I wrote monthly reports and, um, you know, thinking about how to explain it to our supporters at the Department of Defense was a challenge because oftentimes they're not microbiologists and a lot of the work involved, you know, good old fashioned shoe leather microbiology and, you know, counting and, and you know, trying to figure out who was there, what kind of microbes were there. So it was um, really hard, but what you see is that when we put uh, copper on these commonly touched surfaces, and we had precious little copper in the room, uh, there's a picture in the JCM paper, and I have to commend ASM for allowing us to use color pictures um, and actually to show what the hospital room looked like. You can see there's very little copper. It's on the arms of the chair, a little bit on the, the rails of the bed, and we put it where – people are going to touch. Hey, Michael. See, yes. What did you do? Have an empty room get refitted by some mechanics at some point? Is that how you couldn't, because you can't have a patient in there while you're putting copper in, right? No. What we did is um, we fitted, we, we designed the stuff. And at first, this is the uh, part of the funny story of, of doing science is at first I would call bed companies up and I said, could you please make for me a <laughs> copper cap? And they did what you just did. They laughed. <laughs> and I, I tried to get keyboards made. I tried to get mice made. And, uh, again, this is when one of the co-authors, uh, Peter Sharp and another co-author, Harold Michaels, who work with the industry side of things, they introduced me to companies that would make me prototypes. Mm -hmm. And we paid for all the prototypes out of the grant. Mm. Um, the, these were not um, gifts uh, with the exception of the visitor's chair was um, donated because um, they actually saw the value proposition of, of participating in the study. So they donated the chair, but they had no uh, part in the design or, or whatnot. And so you had multiple rooms. You had six rooms in each hospital, right? Yeah, well, six rooms at Sloan and MUSC and four at the VA because the VA is a smaller hospital. And and this is not pure copper, right? It's an alloy? Uh, no, that's actually in the first table of the JCM paper describing the alloy. I see, percent copper content. Oh, yeah, there it is, copper, nickel, brass. Yeah, we, we wow. went the gamut. And again, it's what we could get. Yeah. Um, the bed rails had pure copper, which is the most antimicrobial, and the IV pole uh, was made out of um, a copper nickel, and it had to be structurally sound. So all of these things had to go to our equipment department, mm. and they had to pass muster. Mm. Um, right. We had to have them certified as being safe. We had to have them as being certified as being strong. And then I got to appear before the appearance committee of the hospital. <laughs> I and, never knew a hospital to care about appearance. <laughs> oh no, they have appearance committees. Oh, they must have, they must have uh, bad taste. No, I think that it's <laughs> it's it's really remarkable. And every hospital has an appearance committee and and as you're in New York City, you can well imagine who's on the appearance committee of our friends in New York. Yeah, Donald Trump. <laughs> well, then he would add gold. <laughs> then he would add gold. But um, so <laughs> to make the long story short, um, uh, and this has to do with the statistics, and I don't want to over ever overinterpret my data. And so you can do some fancy statistics to argue that copper was 99% cleaner than the plastic parts. But so I only present averages, and on because an average takes into account fugitive emissions mm -hmm. and a fugitive emission is a sneeze uh, someone who vomits someone who has an accident uh, a blood spill you know all these fugitive emissions because healthcare is a stochastic process it's ever-changing every patient 
is unique. Every day is different. And if we really wanted to answer the meta question, did copper control infections, you had to do it in a real situation with real patients and real care. And we did it at um, Sloan's a teaching hospital, as is MUSC, as is the, the VA. So you got the gaggle of residents and fellows coming in and out along with the, the normal issues with uh, the attending physician and the nurses. And any of you who have ever been in a hospital can appreciate how busy an intensive care unit is. And at the end of the day, copper reduced uh, the burden dramatically such that it was really below that magic number most of the time. Hmm. And if you look at the green zone, uh, you see that the bed rail basically had no bacteria for uh, 46% of the time that we cleaned the bed rails. When we went and sampled the bed rails, 46% of them had no bacteria. Hmm. So you begin to look at it and say, well, if there are no microbes there and our, our limit of detection was pretty sensitive because we sampled 100 square centimeters and you're looking for one colony. So the the JCM paper in its supplement, the, I hate supplemental sections, but they won't let me include this one figure. And in the two supplemental figures, I show the distribution of the microbial burden in the built environment uh, over time. And it's every sample off of the bed rail. It's mm -hmm. plotted for each week. And uh, the three hospitals are in three different colors. And what you see is that the burden bounces all over the place depending on the bed. And then on the next figure, I look at it with copper versus non-copper. And I don't separate out the hospitals because it get too busy. And again, you see that the control bed rails are all over the place. They bounce like uh, the proverbial bouncing ball, while the copper bed rails are in the weeds. Hmm. They're all down at that zero, and the majority of them are under 250. Yet, there's a few yellow triangles that are up above 250, and again, indicating that, you know, stuff happens. Yeah. You know, you take care of patients. And so, that established that, one, the environment represented a clear and present danger to the patient. And secondly, that copper could reduce that burden substantially. And, and the way burden is often uh, conveyed in the infection control literature is they always talk about log kill. And I know from my medical students, they don't think in logs. So I always talked about numbers and percentages to help them appreciate what was going on. And I talk about, you know, 10,000 bacteria or rather than a log of four, because to the most, to the average medical student, they don't know what a log of four is. So, so Michael, in this study, were the surfaces cleaned as usual? Yeah, we, uh, that was one of the things the institutional review boards required is that we couldn't interfere with the normal standard of care. Right. And so environmental services um, come in on a daily basis and clean each room uh, via a prescribed list. The environmental services teams are well-regulated and well-trained, and they clean all the rooms once each day, with the exception of Sloan, that was actually cleaning the rooms twice a day mm -hmm. because they had an outbreak of uh, KPC that was KPC. smoked. Uh, Klebsiella pneumonia carbapenemase resistant, which is one of these new C, it also can be referred to as CRE, carbapenemase resistant enterobacteriaceae. You see a lot of that. You see that quote cited a lot. So it's you're right, one has to know the terms. And so what Sloan did while we were conducting our study is their infection control team said, we have this outbreak, we have to get it under control, we're gonna go to clean twice a day. And Sloan then went to clean twice a day and uh, it, in order to try to contain the outbreak uh, that was moving in the hospital. And uh, we controlled for that in our analysis and it, it didn't appreciably alter our, our results. Um, because Actually, did it appreciate alter the cleanliness overall? No. Did it make a difference? 
No, and that's the subject of the second paper that's in uh, the Infection Control and Hospital Epidemiology right. Journal of last week, as well as a paper we published in American Journal of Hospital Infection, in which um, we showed that how quickly bacteria rebound in the environment. They literally come back depending on the load in the room in the beginning within two and a half to four hours. They're back to baseline. So again, this shows us that the microbes are this resilient biofilm. It's a living, breathing microbiome of the, of the hospital, if you will, that we're constantly battling, even in the fact that we're using pretty significant uh, disinfectants. We're using quaternary ammonia compounds to, you know, the, the prescribed method is you clean with soap and water and then you disinfect. And so we're, you know, the hospitals are doing everything they can, but the microbes have adapted with us as we've cleaned, so have the microbes. And they come back very quickly. And that takes us to the second paper where copper continuously limits the concentration of bacteria resonant on bed rails within the intensive care. Uh, this was an idea of my senior technician, Hubert Attaway, who, you know, he was the guy who was, clean, who was uh, collecting the data and reducing it to a number by plating them and counting them. And it was really his intuition. He says, I wonder how fast the bacteria rebound. Because he was amazed that we got bacteria off of these rails every time we went in there to look. The copper because or the uncopper? Both. Both. He oh. says, he said, they're cleaning them. Shouldn't, you know, they be not there for a couple, three days? I mean, he was just blown away at how quickly the bacteria came back. Yeah, well, people are touching these all the time. It's not surprising, right? No, it's it's not surprising. I said, yeah. this is an active healthcare environment. It's not, you know, like, and this is, this is the way our EPA evaluates um, our disinfectants is they, you know, apply them on um, a laboratory situation. They ask, you know, do you get a 99.9% .9 kill? And if so, mm. what happens? And they're using virgin plastic that is not scraped and been used and scrubbed. And so Hubert suggested what he refers to as the six bed study. And we first asked how fast do they rebound and we were evaluating cleaners, and that's the American Journal of Infection Control paper, which I didn't send to you guys, in which we asked the difference between uh, two out there, one a quaternary ammonia compound and one a quaternary ammonia compound with a little alcohol in it. Mm. And um, some hospitals don't like the one with alcohol in because it smells funky. Mm. Um, and you have an appearance committee and you have a funky smell committee as well <laughs> um, because, you know, they – the only thing that works really well against C. diff is bleach, and that's yeah. where the funky smell committee comes from because everybody you know, knows the smell of bleach, and they don't like it. And um, so I, I learned a lot about infection control and, and the emerging thing, and um, what we found— which, which cleaner was better, with or without alcohol? With alcohol. Yeah. Because you, you have two agents— you have the dehydrating effect of the alcohol and then the quaternary ammonia compound disrupting the membrane potential. Mm -hmm. And so, again, it's, it's really shoe leather microbiology of how do you inactivate a microbe, you know, you know, thinking about antibiotic resistance and what to take out and, you know, what are your targets. And, you know, there's been a lot of really sophisticated micro done to look at these things and... You know, porins come into play and all the things that, you know, are in the journal of bacteriology year in and year out, all of these things come into play in the design of, of um, these disinfectants. So in this second paper, we asked the question about the disinfectant that's used at the majority of the hospitals in the United States, which is uh, quaternary ammonia compounds, the one that we used in the medical university hospital. Its trade name is um, Virix 256, and it's dispensed from an automatic diluter as a concentrate, and we made sure it was at the right concentration. And we asked, uh, following label directions, 
following the prescribed guidelines, we literally went to the hospital manual and asked, how do you clean a bed rail? So we read how to do it. And then Hubert and the other author, uh, Sally Ferry, went over there and cleaned the rails and uh, then measured the concentration of bacteria that would come back. And we did it on copper rails as well as um, plastic rail beds. And again, the patients are in there and there's care going on. And what we learned is that copper, again, is keeping the burden below this magic number that represents a risk to the patient. And so we reinforce the concept that copper is continuously augmenting cleaning. And that's all it is, is it's, it's, it's continuously inactivating microbes as they alight on the surface. And that's how it's augmenting cleaning because copper is continuously working. So, uh, Mike, I really think it should be commended because this sounds like a very convincing uh, set of papers on a topic which is not easy. Uh, but I have a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, one of them is uh, you must have thought about uh, following sort of what you may call the Vogue and do metagenomics on the samples instead of looking at live uh, colony forming units. What was the thinking about that? The thinking about that is uh, we have a freezer full of samples to do the omics on. And uh, one of the papers I'm presently working on is, is poor man's omics called pulse field gel electrophoresis. And we did pulse field on every MRSA isolate that we have and that paper is in the process of being uh, sent through the author, the authors of the paper to uh, get it ship shape ready to go out. The omics okay. one is the problem is is um, the military wrote a very prescribed contract, and uh, omics was not within our scope of work. It was one of the things that died um, in our proposal. Well I have to tell you that I'm glad you did it this way because uh, I am not a big fan of a bunch of papers which ex which have come out when you say we by omics can figure out that we have this, this, and that on the toilet seat. Well, the problem with that is they're not looking at live versus dead. The bugs could have died, who knows, years yeah. ago. And, and so it seems to me that it's, it's, it's not a good idea to start out with omics, when uh, the question is not relevant, omics don't tell you don't tell you what you need to know. He he did it for you, Alio. No, this was one of the advantages of having the infection, the infectious disease specialist. Um, our overarching goal is what would the community of practitioners believe, and recognize that the community of practitioners, unless they're card-carrying, trained omics people don't really know how to well, interpret sorry, those data. You, you, you would not have convinced this card-carrying microbiologist had you done it by omics only. So I, you know, I think this is more general. That It's really a bad idea to go for, for, uh, for omics when it doesn't work. Well, Michael, the infection control people wouldn't, wouldn't believe the omics, right? They believe no. the culturing. They, they believe what they can have because yeah. live bacteria represent a danger, and you don't know who's dead. It's exactly right. That's exactly the point. I mean, Alio, in this point. kind of study, that is a really critical part of it, right? You could argue that a toilet seat just doesn't really matter, but this is involving people's health, so you have to know what's alive. Yeah, and, you know, we we wrestled with that a lot. And, you know, folks ask me questions is, why didn't I go after light switches and doorknobs and other things that I could have bought immediately off the shelf? And I said, well, in the ICU, they weren't relevant. Mm -hmm. Sloan Kettering mm -hmm. has automatic doors like the grocery store. Cool. So would a doorknob <laughs> work? No. That's great. Um, the light switches um, are controlled before hand hygiene. And so you deal with the lights if you're the healthcare worker before you wash your hands, and then you wash your hands. So that's an irrelevancy. And, you know, the, the low-hanging fruit that I could have bought off the shelf, we ignored. And there have been some papers out there that have literally looked at toilet seats with copper and have looked at uh, light switches and doorknobs. 
But I asked the question, What? this was a patient-centered study because I wanted we, – we never took our eye off of the ball of the meta question. Will the limited placement of copper to lower burden reduce infections? Yeah, and well, so, you did beautifully. This is you, so as I can see, this is a very convincing answer, and you you should be saluted. Can I ask a different question? Sure. Also, um, there are a couple of papers that I've seen which talk about bacteria becoming and fungi becoming resistant to copper. Do you think that's an issue? That uh, is a, the fundamental issue there is if you read the mechanism papers, there are there are wet studies and dry studies. This was done, all of these surfaces are dry. So this is in the absence of water. And we are recovering microbes from the environment. We are not depositing microbes on these surfaces. So these are not culture-grown microbes. These are the true my animals in in the wild. This right. this is truly the animals in the wild. And the so you don't think that they can they could uh, become resistant because they're not growing there. They're just sitting there, right? Just just sitting there. And never say never uh, sure. because we know from the water industry that if the pH of the water changes and you get calcium deposition on the copper surfaces, the bio, the bacterial biofilm will develop on that carbonate, you know, uh -huh. because it's insulated from the copper. But because the copper was cleaned each day, again, we're following the standard of care, and the EPA requires this. These materials are registered with the United States EPA, and they were given a public health claim. And in fact, copper is the only solid surface that has the ability to say they kill bacteria, and that's regulated uh -huh. by the EPA. All the other things out there that are antimicrobial don't. They have a treated article exemption, so they can't equivocally say that they kill bacteria on contact. The only one that the EPA will allow that to be said equivocally are copper and its alloys containing greater than 60% copper. And they painstakingly went through and did all the experiments that the EPA prescribed, demonstrating that the alloy concentration to get the mark set by a series of standard tests that the EPA prescribed, the mm. minimum the the minimum concentration of copper must be 60%. And okay. so that's the other reason we went with it. Uh, again, recognizing that we had to go to through institutional review boards, and we didn't want to do informed consent where we were using something that could create danger. Uh, we went with something that was acknowledged and having obtained a registration from a government agency to be placed in to a healthcare setting. So there was a lot of complexities that went on, and I learned more about regulatory issues than I ever cared to. But as our good friend Ellen Jo Barron was on, um, she didn't even get to touch in, touch that aspect of how our clinical laboratorians doing microbiology have all sorts of paperwork and regulatory issues that sure. we we in the lab only, you know, we shudder to think about what they have to go through. And to go back to the answer is it's all about concentration. Um, when you do the math and you ask how much copper is liberated at that surface and internalized into the bacterium, via, and the copper will be transmitted in via the sodium pump, and the concentration uh -huh. that is theoretically achievable is about six molar, and that accumulates inside the bacterial cell. And so resistance is going to be hard, but the true mechanism of action of, of copper is alluded to in that paper by Warns and Kivo that was an embryo. And they have a beautiful figure in which they show, uh, and they're doing it on dry surfaces. And what, and the way they do it is they take um, VRE, vancomycin-resistant enterococci, or MRSA, or E. coli, or anything, and they put about um, 
10 million microbes in 20 microliters, and they deposited on a metallic surface. And then they asked the question with dyes, and um, the dyes that they use are CytoS to ask the question about DNA, and then they use another one to assess membrane potential, uh, one of the other uh, vital stains, and they use CTC. So it's Cyto9 for DNA and, and CTC for, for this assessing an energized membrane. And when you put these microbes on these, these coupons that they're called of stainless steel or copper, in four hours, you see a lawn of bacteria glowing red for indicating that their membranes are fully energized and you can see their DNA. But when you visualize the microbe under the microscope, that has sat on a copper surface for only 10 minutes, all the respiration is gone. You see no energized membrane. And if you ask the question about DNA, there is no detectable cytos signal. So the DNA is destroyed. And it goes back to the mechanism where the electron is stolen by the metal, taken away. The microbe continues to pump protons. So inside the cell... Because you're, you're lacking that electron acceptor, you literally begin to bleach your proteins, peroxidate your membrane, and then fracture your DNA from the free radicals that are generated. And, and Kievel's group has been pioneering um, this stuff with confocal microscopy, elegantly determining, and, and that's – you know, I, I've, been, I've been sitting on this student's dissertation committee looking at um, microbial electricity generation and running the system backward, feeding microbes electricity in order to make autotrophic um, fixation of carbon. And so I've been reading all this literature that I hadn't been exposed to about electrogenic generation, and, and electrons are moving constantly in bacteria. And they, they have these exquisite cytochromes and other electrocarriers. And so microbes have been moving electrons. And so I think the way copper is killing is, is it's stealing the electron from the bacterium, sending it into a um, deficit, and the free radicals just generate and kill the cell. Hmm. And I think if you go and… Was it, was it St. Georgi? Who said biology is all about where to park your electrons? <laughs> That's exactly correct. And, you know, I, I learned that as a graduate student from Howard Guest when I, I took my, my microbial fizz. And, you know, this whole emerging field, uh, we, we got to get some of these electric guys on because I think the whole emerging field is like the reinvention of photosynthesis by the bacteria. Mm, you know, how. Good analogy. Very good analogy. And because it's all autotrophic too, so it's so to make the long answer to your story, I think resistance is always the demon in the closet, and the best thing that we can do is to make certain that the bacteria are in close proximity to the copper, and then the electron will be stolen and everyone will die. I can't wait for uh, Victor to ask a question, Vincent. I'm sure he's going to ask, Vincent. Vincent, I said. Did I say Victor? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. Losing it. I'm losing it, but that's okay. Uh, so, wait, Michael, did you give us the summary of the second? I don't remember. Uh, the summary of the second paper is copper continuously works uh, regardless of its circumstance of whether or not it's um, you know tarnished or not. Right. And it keeps the bacterial load and it supplements cleaning. Right. So... Which takes us to the third manuscript. I'll get my question in, uh, Elio, don't worry. Which takes <laughs> us to the third manuscript. Um, I'll make the long story short. We asked the question, with this limited amount of copper that we placed in the room, and the patients were randomly assigned by bed control. We had nothing to do with where, who, what patient went where. Bed control decides where they go. Bed control was blinded as to where the patients went. They, did, they were, didn't know where the copper was? They didn't know where the copper was. Wow. Bed control was blinded. They knew. They didn't even know it was in the ICU. Bed control is this 
entity that you know assigns patients to rooms, and it's medically determined if they're going into a medical intensive care bed. Con- you know, the attending physician says this patient needs an ICU bed, and mm-hmm. bed control finds them one. And most of our ICUs are 100% occupied all the time at Sloan Kettering and and MUSC and the VA. So whenever a bed opened up, they got randomly assigned. When the patient was admitted to the room, uh, an Apache score was determined. And an Apache score is an acronym, and I hate acronyms, but in this case, it's... No, you don't. You're always using them. (laughs) (laughs) I I said that especially for you. Uh, But... um, the intensivists, these are people who are specialists for um, the intensive care unit. Apache stands for the Acute Physiology and Chronic Health Evaluation, and we use the Apache 2 score. And it effectively gauges your severity of illness. So huh. it's a great equalizer because not everybody is as ill in the ICU. They're not you know, mice, as Vincent said earlier. Mm-hmm. Every patient is different. Um, and so we asked the question, were there any difference between the patients in copper versus non-copper rooms? It's the same it's, part, of, this part of the same study, Michael, or separately done? No, it's part of the same study. Okay. Apache score is done, uh, has been in the literature for a, for a while. So, um, and this was uh, Ken Sepkowitz's brilliance who suggested that we get the Apache score for each and every patient uh, in order then to use it as a comparator for our, our data. Uh, and so we, we did get the Apache score for it. And uh, so there's no difference in the demographics. Half of the patients, uh, we had about uh, 650 patients enrolled in the study. And when we finally... Um, Close the study, there were 615, 614 split amongst the two rooms, uh, two types of rooms, I should say. And uh, we then asked the uh, fundamental question, what is actually going on? Did, did copper reduce the, the number of infections? And the answer was a remarkable yes. I mean, it's it... Really, very convincing. It... Um, we cut the infections literally in half. When you look at um, the issue, we, the way we did the study is we were blind in the beginning. We didn't know whether or not we were going to see a big enough difference because we were powering it on Bob Weinstein's suggestion that the environment contributed 20%. So, so that we wouldn't be dead by the time we got to the end of the study, we powered it with a two-part question uh, or an or, whether or not they were had an infection or they became colonized by two indicator organisms. Methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, which accounts for 64% of the infections in ICUs in the U.S., or VRE, which account for a substantial fraction of the infections in an ICU as well. So we figured we would have it there. And colonization always is is thought to precede infection, or so uh, some folks would argue. And so we had 273 patients in the copper arm of the study and 279 patients in in the non-copper arm of um, the study. And then we asked the question, how many infections did we see? And in the copper rooms, we only saw 10 infections, and the non-copper rooms, we saw 26 infections. So that totaled out to a a 58% relative uh, risk reduction, and it had a p-value of 0.013. And uh, we did not get to significance on colonization alone. And part of that, I think, has to do with the fact that half of our patients admitted to the ICU came in with an infection. So these data become even more powerful when you consider that half of our cohort Mm. already had an infection and we were asking if they got a second infection. Yep, beautiful. Then uh, there's some data that aren't in the paper, but I'll, I'll share with you. We asked the question, does Apache or the severity of illness 
really play into things. And when we did the statistics, we learned that if your Apache was under about 30, and if your Apache is over 30 in your I, in, in the ICU, the likelihood of you leaving the ICU alive is very, very low. And uh, so again, that's indicating that the patient's normal barriers are breaking down. And what we found is that um, if your Apache was over 30, there was really no difference in being placed in a copper versus non-copper room. But if it was below 30, you had a 58% less likelihood of getting an infection. And if you were on an antibiotic already because you came in infected, your likelihood of getting an infection was um, about 75% less. So it's almost as if the copper is acting in synergy. But if you go back to the Kivel and Warren's paper from MBio, we know that copper prevents resistance transfer. And Weinstein, in his original fig, in his original supposition, was attributing a lot of infections in the hospital due to antibiotic resistance. But if copper is destroying DNA, you're not going to move promiscuous plasmids amongst the patient's yeah. normal flora. Right. We did that. We did a, that paper, remember? Yeah, we did. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, when you look at all of these things, and and the final figure of the paper that's in um, the Environmental Infection Control Hospital Epidemiology paper is asking the question about uh, does burden really matter? And so we didn't have burden for every single patient in our study because we only could afford to measure burden once each week. So where we had the data, and I we could have done some statistical tricks with imputation of data where you take the cohort and then you assign a value based on the week. And, you know, there's all sorts of statistical tricks, but the authors and I thought, well, that's not really kosher. Let's use real data. And so when we use the real data and we ask the question, where are the infections based on burden? And we didn't fractionate it by Apache score, which we probably uh, should have done. Uh, what you see is that when your burden is below 500, 7% of that quartile population. So what we did is we had 333 patients for which we had data. You divide that by in four, and then you ask what fraction based on these burden values developed infections. And that's the last figure of the paper that effectively says burden, folks, does indeed matter. The higher the burden in the room, the greater the likelihood you're going to get the infection. And in fact, if the cumulative burden for those six objects was above 8,000 colony forming units, you had a 21% likelihood of developing an infection. Yeah, I think that makes, it makes sense and it's done beautifully. I found that very convincing. So, Michael, is there uh, any evidence for viral hospital-acquired infections, and would you expect copper to impact that as well? There's the question. There's the question. <laughs> the answer to Vincent's question is yes, viruses do move within the hospital, and in fact, they move just as easily. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the sneezing does indeed move them throughout the hospital. And the other thing is that copper does indeed inactivate. In fact, this is work, again, of Bill Keevil of the University of Southampton, who established that. And he did this via a series of very elegant controls using um, lung cells that grow influenza virus. He showed that it doesn't kill influenza as fast as it kills bacteria, but it does indeed inactivate influenza virus. Okay. So what's the, what is the next step, Michael? Are hospitals going to adopt this or do you need to do more studies? What I would very much like to do is to ask the question, what happens in a general medicine unit? I see. Uh, because the patient is ambulating there. And so I think we really need to figure out where to put copper in hospitals in order to assess the true value proposition. Right. In the ICU, it's a no-brainer. I would immediately get copper beds. And in fact, when we asked the question, what's the most significant object in the room, statistically, it was the bed. And I should also point out that um, not all of our patients saw all of the dose of copper because 
bless the patient's families who move chairs. And so <laughs> when you move a chair between rooms mm -hmm. so mom and dad can sit and visit with you, yep, yep. Um, you reduce the dose. And we got hammered by the peer review committee that – not all of our patients saw 100% of the dose. And the other problem we had is, unfortunately, America is becoming obese. And I didn't think to have a bariatric bed made out of copper. Mm -hmm. And so when the patients were too big to fit in a copper bed, I literally had to take the copper, which was a major portion of the dose, out of the room. And there we learned, that's how we learned that the bed was the most significant variable. Wow. So how much, Michael, would it cost to refit uh, bed rails in, you know, a lot of hospitals? Just the bed rail. Do you have any do you have any sense per hospital or per bed, maybe? Well, let's give you the facts. First, the average hospital bed is um probably we're just gonna round up so we can do the math on on the podcast, about fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. And I had to purchase bed rails from the manufacturer brand new and I paid five thousand dollars a set for bed rails okay. that I then placed copper on. And the amount that I spent having an artisan make it um was um approximately five hundred dollars a rail. Mm -hmm. So it adds our, up to about what? It adds up to when you do the math and you ask the question that 96 patients will be in that bed each year and the bed will last 10 years, it totals out to about 10 cents a bed. Hmm. So if you ask the patient being admitted to the room, will you give me a dime to prevent an infection that's going to cost your insurance company and you 43000 extra dollars, what do you think their answer would be? Yeah, right. It makes perfect sense, but whether – I hope this um, happens. I just hope this – at least on the beds, it makes perfect sense. On the beds, it can be done, but um, the bed manufacturers are in love with injected molded plastic. Mm. Uh, the developed world still has metal beds, and um, my colleagues in Santiago – um, have developed a copper rail that's really pretty elegant that they're doing it uh, very inexpensively with. And they're literally transforming their beds because um, the nation of, of Chile is actually incorporating um, the copper story into their new hospital construction. Oh, wow. Good for them. Maybe people will bring their own copper rails with them when they get admitted to a hospital. <laughs> I might. Well, you know, that's one of my pleas when, I, when I've when i been out giving this talk is I, I always encourage folks to do your part for hospital-associated infections. And wow. the easiest thing you can do is wash your hands and encourage your healthcare team to wash your hands before they interact with you. Yeah. And don't be bashful about telling them. Yeah. Before you leave, before we leave, I really have to congratulate you, I think, in the name of what? The name of humanity <laughs> with a contribution to our health, which may be very significant. Good for you. Not many of us have a chance to do a piece of work like this in our lifetime. No, I, I was, thank you for that wonderful compliment. And, and it's, it's really a, a team sport. Um, we, we recognized up front how many people died of, uh, uh, of hospital associated infections and, I, I've been thinking a lot about this. You know, HIV has a symbol, the red ribbon. Uh, breast cancer has, of course, the the pink ribbon. But I was trying to think of a, an appropriate symbol for the victims of hospital associated infections. And the 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 thing I came up with is um, uh, the new Lincoln penny that has a the symbol of a shield on the back. Mm. Nice. And never before has a, a symbol as, as ubiquitous as the Lincoln scent provided us an opportunity to change the tide. Because if you look at its expression, e pluribus unum, uh, out of one, many, and that's what the Latin translates. So the next time you encounter the change in your pocket or purse, I ask that you look at the back of that penny and see the shield to remember the forgotten. And that the penny not be removed from circulation until we address the issue of thinking about hospital-associated infections. Because we can do something about it. We, we now have some data. Great idea. I think you should start a petition at, uh, what is it, whitehouse.gov. Whitehouse.gov. <laughs> not to remove the penny. 
Uh, before we, we finish up here, I just want to read one letter because it is completely relevant to this okay. episode. And that is from Jenny, who happens to be a nurse, an RN, a, actually a BSN and RN. Uh, hello, TWIM friends. Jenny here, a longtime fan of TWIV, then TWIP, and of course, happily learning from your great TWIM podcasts. Thanks to Michael Schmidt's fascinating discussions, including those regarding copper and microbes, which has really got me thinking and then she quotes from your website, Michael, about copper and its antimicrobial activity. She continues, it appears that copper does have a contribution to make, and I can imagine that there will be some formidable costs in changing surfaces from plastic and alloy and steel to copper. To decrease costs of switching to copper surfaces for commonly touched fomites, microbe-carrying objects like IV poles and steel hospital infant bassinet units, you're talking to an OB nurse here. I began to think about a sixth or seventh grade, seventh grade experiment we did in school when I was a youngster with copper plating. With that in mind, I did a quick search for a video on copper plating on YouTube and found this one, and she provides a link, which gives you a peek at how easy it can be to copper plate existing metal surfaces. I'm wondering if this could be potentially a cost-saving application for some institutions. Will it be necessary for institutions to repurchase when perhaps they could resurface? Of course, I hope that you realize how very much your team has done and is doing to increase our understanding of the tiny denizens without and within us. What an adventure. Special thanks to you, Vincent, for sparking greater excitement and transparency in science. Thanks to Joe Handelsman. Soil microbes are so vital and so unknown. Thanks for the recent Apple Orchard soil discussion and for her deeply appreciated advocacy for women. Yay. Of course, Elio Schechter and Stanley Malloy. Fantastic. Yours with warmest regards, uh, Jenny. How nice. Well, the only thing I can say to Jenny is great minds think alike. One of the first, <laughs> things, one of the first things we tried was copper plating um, the plastic bed rail. And we were successful in actually doing it. But then we discovered something, that when you fly a bed rail via Federal Express, it's in an unpressurized cabin. And the plating liquor, because injected molded plastic is porous, the plating liquor comes out hmm. and it's the plating liquor is effectively an acid and it made it unsafe. And um, it wasn't a commercial product. And what we learned talking with the company that did the plating is they said, well, we could have told you that up front. Mm -hmm. Injected molded plastic is not designed to be plated. And so it's going to require some re-engineering. And I think the biggest cost is not going to be in the metal itself, but in the uh, re-engineering to make the materials um, applicable. And we're working with um, bed rails are changed all the time in the hospital. And there's a company out of Indiana that is looking at um, making copper sleeves for bed rails so that they could just slip right over and then they could sell it as an aftermarket nice. product. That sounds like a great plan. So great, yeah. great minds think alike, Jenny. Excellent. Well, this episode of TWIM uh, will be found, as usual, on iTunes and also over at microbeworld.org slash TWIM. And if you like what we do, one of the things you can do to help us is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe and leave a comment or a rating there. That helps to keep us visible so more people can learn about this wonderful world of microbes. If you have any questions or comments, send them to twim at twiv.tv. Elio Schechter can be found at his wonderful blog, Small Things Considered. Thanks for joining us, Elio. Well, it's always fun. This was special. Yeah. This was a special event. So thank you, thank you, Michael. I really enjoyed it. Well, thank you. And I... I'm I if you had a video on me you could have saw me blush. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Someday Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Many many thanks Michael. Great study. Thank you. Really nice and worth the wait. It was a a long time coming but I felt it important and we had to do it right. Um we could have dashed something off easily but it was important to do all the controls. So uh, when did you start this? How many years ago? Uh, literally, we started it in 2007 in May. Wow. Mm. 
I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Many thanks to the American Society for Microbiology for supporting TWIM, in particular Chris Condian and Ray Ortega for their technical help. Music used on TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. Microbiology.